Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are moving to plenary three. And plenary three, again, it deals with case law. And it's a case law, case law monitor session, which will be done by our acting executive legal services, Ms. Eleanor Hambridge. Now, some of, some of the issues that Ms. Hambridge is gonna deal with is the balancing between the fairness and the speedy resolution of the dispute. How do you balance the two? She's also gonna deal with the duties of the commissioner. Should we turn the boardrooms into a courtroom? That's the question. And the issue of with less legal formalities. I know Judge Van Niekerk dealt with the issue of less legal formalities, but I think Ms. Hambridge is gonna deal with those issues. Now, she holds a position of acting executive legal services at the CCMA, a position she has held since 1 April 2019. She has more than 30 years experience in the field of labor relations and 20 years experience as an arbitrator and trainer. She is an admitted attorney of the High Court and she has worked in a private practice. She also has experience as a university lecturer teaching labor law and commercial law. She was also a task team convener for draft training material for the Labor Relations Amendment Act, number six of 2014. She holds the following academic qualification, BLC and a, a Bachelor of Law LLP degree. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me in welcoming Ms. Sumrich. Good afternoon. Um, I come, come to you today at the Indaba with Exhibit A and Exhibit B. <clears throat> we have worked very hard, as we usually do, on updating the case law book for commissioners, as well as the practice and procedure manual. And right at the end, I will come back to that just to recognize all the commissioners who contributed, who worked through the night. And yes, we've produced Exhibit A and Exhibit B. It's a little bit thicker than usual. It's like me getting older, fatter every year. And more debt, yes. Older, fatter, and more debt. Uh, as, a, as a point of departure, uh, thank you for, for inviting me. Um, I'm going to look at the duties of a commissioner. If, if, it, if the law requires us that we must fairly and quickly resolve a dispute, and we have, we have the discretion to decide on the process, whether it should be inquisitorial or adversarial, but at the same time, we must resolve all the issues with the minimum of legal formalities. What does it really mean? Now let's start. Sorry, um, as, as people would know who work with me, Kiriboni and Nikosikona, I'm the village idiot when it comes to technology, all right? I can't even use this. All right, so the outline, what are the duties of a commissioner? We must resolve a dispute fairly and quickly. Does that mean now, let's pause, does that mean that there's tension between resolving a dispute expeditiously as well as doing it in a manner that is fair between both parties. And then my famous observation, not to make the boardroom a courtroom, let's not over-criminalize labor law. We are dealing with a yardstick of fairness. 
We're not magistrates, we're not prosecutors. We shouldn't call people accused employees. They are employees. We don't talk about charges, we talk about allegations. And please, standard of proof is on a balance of probabilities. It's not beyond reasonable doubt. Now, the theme of this in Darba is that we should look backwards. We should look at what has been happening. What have the courts been telling us? Let's look at a very famous Labour Appeal Court judgment in the Woolworths case and subsequent judgments that reinforces the ratio of the Woolworths judgment. And then taking that all into consideration, let's prepare ourselves for the future. And then finally, in preparing ourselves for the future, it's quite a daunting task. What is really meant by with a minimum of legal formalities? As James referred to, uh, our duties as commissioners, as arbitrators per se, and that doesn't mean that mediators are not important, on the contrary. But in terms of section 138, subsection one, we are required to do the following. We may conduct the arbitration in a manner that we consider appropriate. So we have a discretion. We may decide to go the adversarial route, let the parties fight it out in your hearing room, or we can choose to be more inquisitorial, or we can have a combination of both. But at the same time, we must resolve the dispute fairly and quickly. And we must, here we don't have a discretion, we must deal with the substantial merits of the dispute with a minimum of legal formalities. Now, let's look at the first judgment. It's the judgment of Ramabulana versus CCMA. Now, let me just tell you, this is not the famous Ramabulana judgment that you know from the Labour Appeal Court, where Judge Zondu cautioned us that we don't have the powers to dismiss at conciliation because we will be exceeding our powers. This is a new Ramabulana. And this judgment was handed down by Judge Fanikar on the 3rd of September this year. And in this case, he dealt with the allegation, and, and I read it in review applications all the time. The commissioner was biased. The commissioner entered the arena. The commissioner did this, the commissioner did that. Now, Judge Fanikar, being Judge Fanikar, and he's a very good judge, he read the whole record, the whole transcript of the arbitration, and he came to the conclusion that the commissioner did not misconduct himself at all. But he makes the following observations. He says to determine a dispute quickly might require robust intervention by a commissioner, but the obligation to act fairly to both parties must not be compromised as a result of it. Now we discuss this particular Ramabalana judgment in your case law book, chapter eight, the chapter on arbitrations, as well as in chapter 11 that deals with conduct of commissioners. And let's see furthermore. Similarly, the judge says, the injunction to conduct the proceedings with a minimum of legal formalities is not an invitation or a license to disregard the party's right to a fair hearing. The broad principle that emerges from the case law is that commissioners, like judges, ought to exercise caution when they intervene in the proceedings over which they proceed. But he's not saying you cannot intervene. He is saying to you it's your duty to curtail the proceedings, but you must do it in such a manner that you are fair to both parties. Let's just go back to the very, very, very famous Concord judgment of Kusa versus Taiying Metal Industries and, and, and others, and this case is discussed in detail in Chapter 8 as well on arbitration and Chapter 3 on jurisdiction, where the Constitutional Court told us what is our real job. Our real job is to look for the real dispute. The Court, with reference to Section 138.1 of the LRA, says, 
We must deal with the substance of a dispute between the parties. We must cut through all the claims and the counterclaims and reach for the real dispute between the parties. But in doing so, there are three considerations. We must do it in such a manner that we actually resolve the dispute. Harun, I know you don't agree with me, but arbitration is a way to resolve a dispute, not only mediation. Okay. And yes, you know, he laughs at me when I say these things because he knows as well as I do that mediation is the number one process. Having said that, we must resolve the real dispute, we must do so expeditiously, and we must act fairly. Right, and this judgment, like I said, is discussed in the chapter on arbitration as well as the chapter on jurisdiction. This judgment is very important for a variety of reasons. Uh, because in the same judgment, the court said, you, don't, you are not bound by the categorization of the dispute as reflected on the certificate of non-resolution. Uh, non you, Mr. or Miss Arbitrator or Mrs. Arbitrator, it's your job to decide what is the real dispute. And sometimes you need evidence for that. You can't always, at the point of departure, where various points in limine are raised, decide whether you have jurisdiction or not. Sometimes you need evidence. So, what does it for us, what does it mean for us if we say we should resolve a dispute fairly and quickly? For me, it means we must guard against an approach where we over criminalize labor law. But at the same time, we must be mindful of the rules of evidence. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, all right? We can't say, well, I have powers in terms of section 138, and I will conduct the arbitration in this manner. Nobody will be allowed to cross-examine. You can't do that. That will not be a fair hearing. Let's start with Woolworths, PTY Limited versus CCMA and others, a judgment that was reported in 2011, and it's a unanimous decision. All three judges agree. Judge Nlovu, Judge Davis, and Judge Sandy. Now we're reflecting on the past. We're not going backwards so far. We're only starting 2011, when all of you were still young. And me too, all right, but it's a long time ago. Now, <clears throat> what happened in this case is that Woolworths, being Woolworths, a sophisticated employer, has a list of offenses. They have a disciplinary code where they set out these things are not permitted in our workplace, and should you breach any of these rules, it may lead to a disciplinary inquiry. And notwithstanding the offenses that they listed, they decided to level an allegation against an employee for concealment when concealment wasn't necessarily mentioned in their disciplinary code. But the evidence before the good commissioner showed, overwhelmingly so, I'm sorry to say, that the employee was indeed dishonest. There was video evidence. Her own version was found to be not probable. And the court said, number one, an arbitration is not a criminal court. The alleged misconduct allegation does not necessarily have to be strictly framed in accordance with the wording of the relevant acts of misconduct as listed in the employer's disciplinary code, as long as the employee knows what the allegations are so that she can prepare herself in her disciplinary hearing, that is fine. But it, it, it has to be clear. She, says she needs to have enough facts so that she can prepare herself. And the court also said, when we assess the fairness of a dismissal, we must be aware of the fact that employers or the managers are not necessarily lawyers. And we can't apply the same uh, high standards that a magistrate will do or in relation to the, to, to, to the charges in a criminal court. 
Thus, provided that a disciplinary rule has been contravened, that the employee knew that such conduct could be the subject of disciplinary proceedings, and that she or she was not significantly prejudiced by the incorrect, the incorrect character, uh, characterization, the employer may impose disciplinary action that is appropriate. So, although concealment doesn't per se feature at that time in the disciplinary code of Woolworths, but it was the overwhelming evidence before the arbitrator, she should have found the dismissal to be fair, which unfortunately she didn't do, and it went all the way to the Labor Appeal Court. The court held that where an employee had concealed items underneath her clothes, she had committed an act of gross dishonesty, which resulted in an irreparable breakdown of the employment relationship, and therefore the dismissal was fair. The court also then referred to that famous other Labour Appeal Court judgment of Toyota versus Khadebi and others, where the court dealt with whether long service is a form of mitigation or not. Right, and the Toyota case is also discussed in your case law book in the uh, chapter 18 and 31, dealing with, uh, chapter 31 deals with specific offenses. Subsequently, now we have this famous Woolworth judgment, and hopefully all of us would apply it, but unfortunately that didn't happen. We have Nell versus Construction, Education and Training Authority, and this case was handed down, the judgment, on the 10th of July, 2018, that's a year ago. Once again, a unanimous decision, this time, strong bench, Judge Wagley, the judge president himself, Botswani, and Judge Musi. Once again, the court said that in misconduct matters, one is not required to satisfy the criminal law requirements of a wrongdoing. All that is required is to establish if an employee committed the misconduct and the seriousness of it. Look at the totality of the evidence before you. The court further held that since the employee misled the employer and deliberately concealed the existence of the gift card, she had been dishonest. The allegations leveled at the employee were widely framed. Once again, not good allegations, not well drafted. A little bit sloppy, if I may say so. And, but because, and this is unfortunately where our commissioner erred, the commissioner had limited his inquiry and did not take into account the totality of the evidence. The Labour Appeal Court found that the commissioner conducted the inquiry in an incorrect manner and his award was set aside. The court held, and Judge Witcher this morning very eloquently referred to that. She said, look at the evidence. Don't get sidetracked with labels. The court also said here that labels, labels are totally irrelevant. It's the evidence before you. And notwithstanding the long service of Miss Nell, similar to the lady in the Woolworths case, that didn't assist because they both occupied positions of trust. And therefore, the dishonesty had a direct impact on the substratum of the employment relationship. Once again, the court referred, they reflecting on the past, to the Toyota case. And the now judgment is discussed in more than one chapter. It's discussed in the chapter on evidence. That's your case law book, chapter 12, and then also in chapter 31 on specific offenses. Um, I'm happy to report that the null judgment was actually on a case law monitor. I think it did serve on a case law monitor. It was never reported, which is interesting because it's a very good judgment, but we did discuss it in a case law monitor. Now, we are in the year 2019. Here we get another very strong Labour Appeal Court judgment, EOH Ubuntu versus the CCMA and others. Not the EOH Ubuntu that you remember, this is a new one. This is a one unanimous decision handed down by Judge President himself, Judge Wagley, Murphy and Savage. Here, the Commissioner, with all due respect, and Judge which this morning talked about competent charges, and she said it's fine, remember, 
She said, looked at the totality of the evidence before you. Here the person was, the allegation leveled at the employee was, uh, was that he was in fact dishonest. And then the chairperson of the disciplinary inquiry found him to be negligent. And the commissioner of ours said, but that can't happen. Now, number one, remember, when you are an arbitrator, you have a hearing de novo. You're not there to review a chairperson. You look at all the evidence led. The commissioner found that the categorization of the charge was not competent and awarded compensation in an amount equal to 10 months remuneration. The Labor Appeal Court held that since the evidence, the totality of the evidence showed that the employee was negligent and had wrongfully distributed valuable intellectual property belonging to the employer, the dismissal was fair. So it's about the evidence. It's not about the labels. We're not in a criminal court. We deal with fairness. The Labor Appeal Court also held that it must be considered that employers are not skilled legal practitioners and when they embark on disciplinary proceedings, they sometimes define or restrict the alleged misconduct too narrowly or sometimes incorrectly. The Labor Appeal Court further held that there is no requirement that competent verdicts on disciplinary allegations should, not, should be mentioned. So there is no requirement that competent verdicts should be mentioned. However, and please just remember this, the general principle is still that the employee should not be prejudiced. The employee should still have a fair hearing. Prejudice will normally arise where an employee has been denied knowledge of the case he or she has to meet. Prejudice is absent if the record shows that had the employee been alerted to the possibility of a competent verdict on a disciplinary allegation, he or she would not have conducted his or her defense any differently and would probably not have had another defense at all. All right, so it's about prejudice, but the competent verdict, it doesn't necessarily have to be stated when the allegations are served on the employee. So if the allegations are fraud, let's take a severe case, there's nothing wrong if it then is dishonesty. It's a lesser form as long as there is evidence to show the dishonesty. The commissioner reasoned in EOH Ubuntu that since the tests for dishonesty and negligence are mutually destructive, the chairperson should not have done what he did. Now, I have a problem with that approach. Like I said previously, you are a hearing de novo. You don't, well, obviously you need to look what transpired at the disciplinary hearing, but it's your decision whether the dismissal was fair. You don't defer, you don't review the chairperson either. This approach adopted by the, uh, by the Commissioner was not supported by the Labour Appeal Court and it held that the Commissioner committed a material error of law. Now, once you've committed a material error of law and it's serious enough, in all likelihood your award will be set aside. In this particular case, the evidence established that the employee was indeed negligent. He did distribute property, intellectual property of EOH Ubuntu, all right, to a competitor, all right, it's serious. Now, this judgment was discussed this morning by Judge Witcher. It, it seems to be a, a topic of discussion in the tea room of judges, and needless to say, they are concerned, and so am I. Because I think if we look at what went wrong here, with all due respect, and remember, we all have off days. I also make mistakes. I also read about myself in review judgments. I also want to hide under the table when I see what they say about me. But we can't, we can't conduct an arbitration in this manner anymore. Because now I've showed you three very strong LAC judgments on exactly the same topic. Now we go for number four. This is a policy decision, commissioners. This is a policy decision. The next time we get it wrong, I have no doubt in my mind that the award will be served on the director of the CCMA and he will forward it to me 
to investigate what went wrong. We need to take note of this. If the court comes through so strongly on a regular basis and say the same thing to us, they are saying to us, commissioners, please take note. Do not overcriminalize labor law. What happened? Oh, once again, unanimous bench, Judge Wagley, Coppin, and Katri Sitluani. All right, now, Judge Witcher did discuss the facts this morning very briefly. Let me go through it quickly, because you see, you apply the law to the facts. Every case is different. What happened here, off-duty sergeant shoots an innocent bystander in the stomach. The person was standing about two meters away. Let him, let him, he left him there to die, went back home, didn't phone anybody to fetch, the dying person, he's a policeman, all right? Okay. You know, I wanna feel safe in this beautiful country. Now, number one, the BC panelists rejected the employee's version that he acted in self-defense and found that murder couldn't be proven, but there was culpable homicide, and because it's only culpable homicide, reinstates him with back pay. Now, all right, those are the facts. Those are the facts. So over-criminalizing labor law. We're now dealing with a dispute as if we are in the high court or in the regional court, which we shouldn't be doing. The Labour Appeal Court held that there's merit in the argument that both the arbitrator of the Triple SBC and the Labour Court had adopted an unduly formalistic approach and had made the cardinal mistake of wrongly focusing the inquiry whether it was proven that the employee had murdered the deceased as if it was a criminal trial. Most of the award focuses, and I say this with the greatest of respect because people also dissect my awards, was whether murder was proven. That's the wrong inquiry. Right. The true inquiry is whether the employee's dismissal was fair, taking into account the allegations made against him and the standard of conduct required of him. And the court also then referred to Mashihu versus Saps, also a LAC judgment reported in 2018, and you will get a brief discussion on the Mashiko versus Saps judgment in the chapter uh, eight. That is the chapter on arbitrations, if I remember correctly. Now, the court in this judgment was extremely critical of the BC panelists. That's why I'm cautioning you. That's why I'm saying this is now a policy decision. We need to take note. And I'm quoting from the judgment. Judge Coppen wrote the judgment. He says, the BC panelists let the employee off scot-free with compensation in the form of full back pay, despite having found that he had unjustifiably killed a civilian. The Labor Appeal Court found this conclusion to be unreasonable. The court held that it seemed implicit in the arbitra arbitrator's reasoning, the fact that the employee was charged with murder and not culpable homicide, meant that the allegations had not been proven and therefore no sanction justified. Irrespective of the overwhelming evidence before the arbitrator, the LAC concluded that this finding is unjustified and unreasonable. The court held that in disciplinary proceedings, there is no requirement for competent verdicts to be mentioned. Have you heard this before? Yes. Said in Woolworths, said in Belinda Nell's case, said in EOH Ubuntu, here it comes again. And in the absence of prejudice, just be mindful of that, an employee may be found to have committed the offense that is justified, and the court with approval referred to its own judgment in Woolworths. In the Woolworth judgment, it was held that it will be enough if the employee is informed that the disciplinary inquiry arose out of the facts, that on a certain date, time, and in a certain place, he or she allegedly have acted wrongly or in breach of a, an, an applicable rule or standard. So you must know what to answer. 
It's not a kangaroo court. I'm not proposing that. You must know at least what you need to answer so that you can prepare yourself. But it's not a criminal trial. Although the essence of the allegation against the employee was not murder, he had committed an offence with his official firearm, albeit off-duty, and therefore the LAC found he could not have been let off Scott III with back pay. In any event, the LAC held that both the arbitrator and the Labour Court were wrong in finding that intention could only be proved by direct evidence. So they were even critical of how the arbitrator and the Labour Court had identified how do you establish intention in a murder case. The LAC held that since the employee shot the deceased civilian in his stomach, or not in his legs, does not count in his favour either. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that somebody is saying that. As a policeman, he was trained in the handling of firearms. The employee must have foreseen the possibility that the shooting may result in the death of the deceased, since he shot him only two metres away, in the stomach. The LAC also held that even if the employee had been found guilty of culpable homicide only, the decision of the arbitrator to reinstate him was unreasonable. Given the serious nature of the misconduct, so this is what you need to look at, it was not required of SAPS to lead evidence on the breakdown in the employment relationship. Finally, the LAC held that police are required to protect and secure us, us South Africans, and uphold the law, and not to unjustifiably cause harm to them through unlawful acts. And this is in the Constitution. All right, so that is the triple SBC case. Then, unfortunately, um, not so long ago, and please, I'm not picking on the Port Elizabeth region, uh, Belinda Nell was heard in the uh, Port Elizabeth, I can see Marius is going to kill me now, uh, uh, Port Elizabeth region. We have another case also from that part of the, of the country. We, um, yeah, we're we now in the beautiful kingdom, all right, uh, where the commissioner unfortunately may not have been aware of, of all this case law. And once again, got fixated and obsessed with the labels because she was charged, she used the word charge, with uncooperative behavior and not insolence. Although her conduct was serious, he found the dismissal to be unfair. So that's what we shouldn't be doing. We should look at the evidence. We shouldn't look at the labels, but we must always give a fair hearing. Now, the arbitrator concluded that if the applicant for review, and now that was the employer, uh, felt that the employee's conduct amounted to insolence, they should have been charged, she should have been charged with that. Now, that, that way of arguing, unfortunately, doesn't hold water anymore because the LAC in Woolworth said, and in subsequent LAC judgments, managers are not lawyers. They may get the phrasing of the allegations incorrect, but don't be obsessed with the manner in which the, or the labels, the manner in which the allegations were phrased, look at the evidence before you. On review, um, and interestingly enough, this is Judge Fanica, as again, the court held that the essence of the charge against the employee was, was one of insolence. Further, the arbitrator was required to take a holistic view of the nature of the misconduct alleged. And here I quote, this court has often emphasized, can you see now, they're getting slightly irate with us, slightly, I can pick it up. This court has often emphasized that arbitration hearings are not criminal proceedings and that allegations of misconduct should be dealt with on the basis of the substance of the misconduct and not the particular label attached to it. Judge Witcher said very eloquently, the story mustn't change. Right, we can't also go to, the, to, to, to a completely wrong inquiry. So the story must st stay the same. The allegations, the facts must be proven, but don't, be, don't only focus on the label of the misconduct. 
The court held that it would appear from the arbitrator's own assessment of the evidence that he regarded the employee's conduct as serious. So even the arbitrator says what has happened here is serious, but because the, the charge was defective, in inverted commas, he found in favor of the employee. That we can't do. In this regard, the arbitrator committed a reviewable irregularity by failing to have regard to the substance of what is, is it was that he was supposed to have done. All right. How much time do I have? A few minutes. All right. Now I'm going to rush. And I did hear the question earlier this morning from the CEC of Ikuruleni uh, around, aren't these judgments contradicting a previous judgment? I do recall uh, another LAC judgment, and it's actually in your case law book. Do you want to open it? Chapter 1. It's the Fidelity Cash Management Services case. I do not think that these judgments necessarily contradict that judgment. In that case, the employer came with a different story to the arbitration. So the story changed. And that's why the court in that judgment said, you as the arbitrator must look at the reasons for dismissal at the time of dismissal. All right, now, having said, we shouldn't over-criminalize labor law, and we've seen the strong LAC judgment. What does it really mean in practice? When people argue double jeopardy, is that part of labor law? No. That's a concept that you can raise, or it's a concept of the criminal law. Now, if we look at, and I know James has referred to this very important constitutional court judgment. Let me quickly tell you the facts. Mr. Kruger made racist remarks, and um, the chairperson of the disciplinary inquiry, uh, at that time, uh, Sars had a collective agreement that the chairperson doesn't only make a recommendation, he or she steps into the shoes of the employer, only issued a warning against Mr. Kruger for being a racist, and said he must undergo, um, I think, anger management classes. And Mr. Gordon, as he then was, he was then the head of SARS, overruled the chair and said, no, Mr. Kruger must be dismissed. And this case went all the way to the Concord. So the Constitutional Court then had to decide whether what happened in here was fair or not, and by implication had to deal with double jeopardy. And the court said, but now you must just remember, when it came before the Concord, the only issue that the Concord had to deal with was whether the, uh, they only had to deal with the appropriateness or the reasonableness of the relief. Because our commissioner reinstated uh, Mr. Kruger, because her views were at the time, this is a collective agreement. The chair steps into the shoes of the um, employer. Therefore, somebody else out there cannot overrule the chair. And on that basis, she reinstated uh, the employee, Mr. Kruger. But our chief justice would have nothing of that. He said, no, that's wrong. It was substantively fair. However, it was procedurally unfair because Mr. Kruger was never given the opportunity to make representations. You must follow the odium ultum partum rule. If you, as an employer, intend to overrule your own chair person, you should at least, at the very least, give the employee an opportunity to address you on that. So, for procedure, uh, it was found procedurally unfair. And we discussed this Concord judgment in South African Revenue Services and Mr. Kruger. As you can see, it's been reported everywhere in the case law book in Chapter 18. All right, now, let's just now go a step back. If, if we say we must deal with a dispute with a minimum of legal formalities, does it mean that we must ignore all the rules of evidence. No, it does not mean that at all. 
And this is what makes our jobs so difficult. You need to strike that balance between resolving the dispute fairly and quickly, but at the same time, you must deal with the dispute with a minimum of legal formalities. Now, Exaro, Coal, PTY Limited, Limited versus Chipana and others, and this judgment was handed down on the 27th of June 2019, deals with how commissioners should deal with ESA evidence. I'm not going to go into it in detail because I am running out of time. I hope the PowerPoint presentation will be helpful, and if you want, we can also discuss this judgment at a case law monitor. But what the court make, made very clear, this is not a kangaroo court. You, as the arbitrator, cannot be passive. If you see anything remotely looking like ESA evidence, you should alert the parties, and you should guide them on how they should bring an application to admit the ESA evidence. And you should apply your mind with all those factors listed in the Law of Evidence Amendment Act under which circumstances ESA evidence should be admitted before you admit it. So you don't just willy-nilly admit it or exclude it. You look at all of those factors. And once you've admitted it, you must still decide how much value you attach to ESA evidence. Okay. All right. Now, since we are preparing for the future, which is tomorrow, what about the cautionary, or today even? Um, what now when I'm dealing with a case around sexual harassment? And in a criminal court, we all know that there's a cautionary rule against complainants in criminal proceedings who allege the commission of a sexual offence. In LS versus CCMA and others, and this case was reported in 2014 in the ILJ, the court made it very clear there's no place for it in labour law. So that cautionary rule that you will apply in a criminal trial does not apply when we hear a case involving sexual harassment because often it's he said, she said. Right. Well, I'm assuming it's only women that are the victims of sexual harassment, which is, of course, uh, uh, displaying a huge prejudice. Even men can be sexually harassed. Then, okay, Let's just quickly look at this one, Mara versus Department of Education, handed down on 29 November last year. Uh, the court held that a commissioner, when determining a dispute in arbitration, should not function as if it's in a court of law. Although the proceedings are akin to civil proceedings, we're not, we're not judges. Section 138 of the LRA enjoins an arbitrator to deal with the substantive merits quickly and fairly. And here the court dealt with the age of a witness, which is often an issue in a criminal court. And the court said, when it's an arbitration, that rule doesn't apply. We also discussed this judgment in, uh, in the chapter on evidence. And now that I've looked at substantive fairness, let's quickly do procedural fairness. You recall Avril Elizabeth Home for the Mentally Handicapped versus CCMA, handed down 14 March 2006, where Judge Van Niekerk said, when an employer conducts an internal hearing, he's not supposed to conduct a criminal trial. So can you see, we've now come full circle those sentiments expressed in relation to procedural fairness are now also the sentiments for substantive fairness. And there's a whole chapter in your case law book, is it Exhibit A or is it Exhibit B, dealing with um, procedural fairness, it's Chapter 17. So, what are the learnings? The onus must be discharged when it's an alleged unfair dismissal on a balance of probabilities not beyond reasonable doubt. Judge Witcher gave us a very good definition of what is meant by on a balance of probabilities. You should look at the evidence before you in its totality, but very, very importantly, and I think this is sometimes where we all go a little bit wrong. 
your duty as an arbitrator stands on two legs. First of all, you must decide whether the misconduct was committed. You are a hearing de novo, and then you must decide whether the dismissal was fair. And if you want to have a very good discussion on that, read the T. Waters Clough Municipality Judgment. It is in your case book, law book on 8.7.5. It's an absolute magnificent judgment by Judge Tip. On, it's not only whether the, the misconduct was committed, it's whether the dismissal was indeed fair. Sia Bonga. Can I, just, 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 just before I take questions, I just want to, I want you to turn to the last page of, you can take any exhibit. There we acknowledge all the commissioners as well as Rieta, who helped us with all the technical glitches and did all the typing. There are all the commissioners mentioned who made a contribution. Now, if I wasn't so old and my eyesight wasn't so bad, I would be able to read it. Um, but unfortunately, I can't see the name. So I will go from memory, but because I'm getting old, if I make a mistake, please correct me. The following people should be recognized. Ronald de Vett, Piet van Staden, Norm Sambeleni, Joyce Nkupani, Jabu Nguana, uh, Sihele Mukwena, Abdul, Abdul you here, Abdul Osman, Pat Stone, and please quickly check, did I leave out anybody? Because I would feel so embarrassed. Did I leave out? Very importantly, I made a terrible faux pas now. I omitted to mention two extremely important people. If it wasn't for those two, we wouldn't have had these books. It's Antonio Moodley from the Port Elizabeth region and Foster Malukleka from the Rustenburg region. They worked, they slaved away. The part-timers submitted an invoice, they did it in their own time. Sorry, guys, that I omitted to mention you. You were pivotal to this project. Thank you. Thank you, Eleanor. Uh, There's no questions. Do we, do we have any questions for Ms. Eleanor? You are not at one. Maha, Pomi. Uh, you are not at right at the back. Uh, let's start in the front. Noted. Yeah, th th thank you very much. The, the issue of the, the CCMA up until it's going to court, it's a very strenuous exercise financially. Now, the difficulty is that many of the people who feel that have been victimized by their employees have got a financial challenge of taking these cases up until to the, to, to the constitutional court. Uh, I remember that one, in one of the cases, uh, Judge Mukhwang in particular said that all the people that are affected, they must not financially be afraid to take these cases up until the question call. He used the, the statement of saying that it's better that David must take on Goliath because in the question of course they're going to win. But the, the, the most problem that we, we, we are having is that these people are financially unable, even from the workplace, to take their employers to the CCMA. It takes long years up until end, and people end up accepting the verdict, even though they are adversely affected. What is the quicker and the solution that can protect the employers from being abused by the employers? Because financial. There are, there are ways where we are suspended without pay for so much long period. There are people who have been suspended uh, and end up accepting whatever is it is that they, they, they are dismissed for. But when you look at the merits of the case, if they sustain a little bit longer, they could have won. But the financial constraints are the ones that are forcing. So what is the protection for the people who are being uh, victimized by their financially strong employers. Thank you for that question. Without sounding as if I'm preaching to you, 
commissioners must get it right. We shouldn't be taken on review and unnecessarily so. That's why we have in Dalbas, and that's why we discuss judgments at the case law monitor in the publication on review here today to show you that yes, maybe sometimes we make an error. It has serious, serious repercussions for parties. It's very expensive to, to review a commissioner. You must trans transcribe the record. And like the gentleman said, if you can't afford it, you probably will let it die. Now, there are institutions, for instance, SAS law, uh, legal aid, that can assist parties um, that don't have the financial means to, to, to take your matter further. But having said that, it takes years to get to the Concord. That's why us commissioners must get it right. First time, fairly, quickly, and with a minimum of legal formalities. As to how can we stop parties from bringing unnecessary reviews, there was a judgment handed down, Sean. I showed you during the course of this week where Judge Van Ikker gave an order to say to the two law firms, they, well, the one law firm, the law firm for the SABC, to address him on why he should not award costs de bonis propres. In other words, he's going to give costs if he does, and he's going to give it against the lawyers. So there's a clear message coming from the Labour Court. Don't waste our time. He also said in that same judgment, I'm not here to micromanage an arbitration. He also made reference to piecemeal reviews and that the courts frown upon that. So the judgments in, those, in that regard, sir, are very clear. Uh, they're giving costs more and more against people who are bringing reviews without merit. And you could see from Judge Witcher this morning, you could, you could pick up the frustration. All right, okay. Next question. Uh, Macha. Thank you. Is it okay? Okay. Uh, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, my question really uh, is, is on that uh, SAPS, uh, on that SAPS and the triple SBC matter. Well, I understand that you're saying that we should uh, not stick to labels, but the question is really to say, if the, the, the facts were a bit turned around, for example, in that uh, matter, the person was uh, charged with murder, but was then found guilty on culpable homicide. But what if it was the other way around? Would one be uh, justified in taking a similar approach or exactly the same approach to say, I'm not going to be stuck with labels because the charge and the guilt is based on uh, a lesser charge, but the evidence presented before me in this process points to a more serious charge. Would that be justifiable? So, yes, it's a very difficult question. Why do you ask me such? I thought you were my friend, Commissioner. <laughs> All right, so you're saying that the, the allegation was actually watered down and that the evidence shows more guilt, if I can paraphrase like that. What do you do in a circumstance like that? I think, once again, do not over-criminalize labor law. Don't say, well, the charges are defective. I wouldn't do that. I would just look at the evidence before me, the totality of the evidence, and decide whether the dismissal was indeed fair. And, and steer away from being uh, steer away from adopting an approach that you would see in a criminal court. I don't know if that helps you. Does it? Thank you. No, no the CEC of Ekuruleni may not ask questions. Next question. <laughs> Hello? You are yes. excluded, right at the back. sir. Hi, Elena. Hello? Yes, sir. Can I ask my question? Just a quick and short question to Eleanor. Where is, um, where is the person? All right. That's Il that. Could that's you please uh, identify who you are? Uh, Retief Olivier. Just a short question, and it's not related to the primary issues that we dealt with, but this issue of uh, compensation for procedural unfair dismissals, we use this policy of a solatium, but I've now seen in so many judgments from the courts and labor courts, appeal courts, 
But the Constitutional Court, in this matter that we just raised, I think it's the Kruger case, six months compensation for a procedurally unfair dismissal. So how does that relate to the principle of a solatium? Is that your question, your that's, entire question? That's my Don't question. ask me a follow-up question. Retief, um, what I can say to you is that we're in the process of updating the arbitration guidelines. This is one of the issues that Paul Benjamin will look at. He did say to me, we will have to deal with this issue of SARS and Kruger, where six months compensation was um, awarded for procedural unfairness only. And he gave me the instruction to start thinking. To answer your question very briefly, I still say the law is, is a solatium. But it's within your discretion, uh, the, the quantum, Maybe what happened in the Kruger case, it was very severe. The fact that the odium ultram partum rule was not complied with. Mr. Mloto? Hey. Hello? They are noted, Mr. Mpak. Okay, thank you. I have two questions. One, it has always been understood um, and the duty to ensure that the church is simple and clear and is understood. And more so, most companies are required to produce the guidelines in terms of their own disciplinary code. Now, uh, does the judgments that we have just had about that uh, disregard that? Uh, because if a church, you are charged with a specific um, church, and now uh, the, the judgment seems to be say it doesn't matter. Because it, it, it comes from where the two parties, both the employer and the employee, had a particular understanding of their own internal procedures and processes that they understood it. Now, now that, that's the first question. Then the second question has to do with the statistics that we've been getting here, most of them are from employers reviewing uh, the, the CCMA, uh, probably informed by the, the deep pockets, their capacity and ability. Uh, and to me, it's almost 99%. Um, now, what about the employees and workers? That means if we we have to include, if they had the same capacity, the complexion will be different. Now, I don't think that we are seeing the full picture. We see the strength of money uh, displayed largely by companies. Th that is just for, for noting and say, maybe in pursuance of social justice, we need to begin to do something and say, uh, what does this uh, ruling mean uh, to the poor, given our society and given the issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moloto. That's one of our governing body members, so thank you for that input. I do not think that these judgments that I've discussed today is, they are saying something that you may read into it. In fact, for me, the subtext in all of these judgments are, keep it simple. Like you said, keep it simple and clear. If only they did that, they wouldn't have had to fork out so, so much money to review. So I agree with you that allegations should be simple and clear. I do not think that these judgments are saying something else. What these judgments are saying is, do not only look at the label look at the evidence. But in total agreement with you, allegations must be simple and clear, and yes, employers should have a disciplinary code where they set out all the allegations that may lead to dismissal or disciplinary action for that matter. Uh, as to your second question around most of the reviews only involve employers, I do not necessarily agree with you. Unfortunately, I do not have the statistics, but I read a lot of judgments where employees are assisted by trade unions or they are assisted by the SAS law 
pro bono uh, shop or by the legal aid to bring a, 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 a review. So it's not necessarily only about whether you have money, it's whether your case has merit. But having said that, I'm, I'm also cynical like you, that if I, if I do have deep pockets, I probably could drag the case out for the next couple of years. But the courts are frowning on that. Those tricks, um, they, yeah, they don't hold water anymore. But what we could do as, as the CCMA is maybe from now on in legal, we can start analyzing how many reviews are brought by employee parties or trade unions and how many are brought by employers. Thank you. Mr. Mpaki and Ngongo, you'll be the last one. Uh, I have a simple question and a very short question. Uh, it's with regard to CUSA. CUSA. Yes. According to CUSA, a commissioner has to determine the real dispute. If um, a person or the applicant has referred a dispute to the CCAB of unfair labor practice, yeah. And it becomes apparent during the proceedings that uh, the real dispute is that of unfair dismissal. And uh, the dispute was actually referred, say, about um, three months after the dismissal. Do you run with the unfair dismissal case because the re real dispute is unfair dismissal? Thank you. Now, this is where I'm going to say there isn't necessarily a right answer because I think it does depend on the circumstances of each matter. You saying that the case has been wrongly referred to the CCMA. And at arbitration, you realize that, and I'm taking an example, instead of an alleged unfair labor practice, you are now actually faced with an alleged unfair dismissal. Is that your question? more or less. Now, I think in that instance, um, and I don't want to be accused of being over-proceduralistic when I'm standing here today preaching the complete opposite, I think in a case like that, that could mean that a referral was defective. Because you're busy arbitrating an issue that was never conciliated, and that goes to prejudice. But you are welcome over lunch to disagree with me on that. I, I just become very cautious because, you see, you are going to, if you're going to proceed, in all likelihood, there will be a review and the employer will argue prejudice. They didn't know what they were supposed to come and meet at the arbitration. No, no. Briefly. Sure, thank you. Hello? Yeah. Sorry, um... Eleanor. Yes, where are you? I'm oh. um, no, no, I excluded the CEC of EK. <laughs> it was lovely seeing you all. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Eleanor. No, I'm joking. I just, yes. I, this, this issue of, of, of competent verdicts is going to, it's, it's a bigger issue than what we're making it out to be because um, if I look at your, your weapons there that you have in front of you, um, and I go to chapter 18, and I refer to another uh, LAC judgment, the NUM on behalf of Botsana and uh, Anglo Platinum. Um, on page 171, it says that if, if a new basis to dismiss is discovered after the dismissal, the employer should convene a new hearing into the new charge, okay? Now, with reference to that, I then also want to refer to the LAC judgment that you're referring to. Yeah, the Fidelity Cash Payment Services one, that no, no, one. No, no, oh, no. no, these ones of today. Yeah, and then the, okay. particularly this one. The issue here that we, 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 we're not really addressing is that, let's say for, for interest's sake, we accept that competent verdicts find space in labor disputes. The question, in, if, if I read this case, and, and I've, I've just read an article now, the crux of the judgment is also indicating there that when it comes to competent verdicts, uh, where, where, we, where we find ourselves having to make competent verdicts, we also have to deal with any significant prejudice that's to be suffered by the applicant. But well, doesn't, sorry to rudely interrupt you, haven't I made that point over and over again? 
with reference to the judgment to say, as long as there is no prejudice. This is not a license. Yes, you we understand. It, ultimately, you must look at whether parties are suffering prejudice. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with your, with your explanation, but the, the issue that, that we have here, I don't want to find, I don't want the regions or us to find ourselves in the situation we found ourselves with the employment equity uh, uh, case where uh, the evidence was found or, or, or the reasons were found during the process of the case. My question now, if... if Sorry, you, which case are you referring to? The, I, I don't have the case, but I'll, 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 I'll deviate from it and come back to this one. The issue here, that, the issue here is when, you, when you're finding yourself as a commissioner yeah. leaning towards making a competent verdict yeah. and an applicant is going to be significantly prejudiced, the question we haven't dealt with here, which, which we need to deal with, with when it comes to commissioners, is how do they handle that particular aspect procedurally? Do they stop the process and say, look, I've heard the evidence. This is what, this is what I'm currently seeing now. You guys are leaning towards this. Now, the applicant has not been given an opportunity. I don't know if he has additional evidence which he would, which he would wish to lead in as far as the direction that we are now headed in as far as the evidence that's been produced. And that's a critical issue that we, 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 we're not addressing here, is how do we deal with issues where there is a significant prejudice, uh, because otherwise we're going to open ourselves up to, to, to review and, 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 and procedural irregularities. All right, so my understanding of your question is that let's take now a case where there is an element of prejudice. All right, now, I will try to answer it in this way. As an arbitrator, you are a hearing de novo. I look at the evidence before me. I assess whether the misconduct was committed, number one. Secondly, and far more importantly, I decide whether the dismissal was fair. Now, surely if there was prejudice, I know the answer. I will find the dismissal was unfair. I don't think any of these judgments are remotely saying that you must do this and this and this in all circumstances. Not at all. These judgments talk to specific facts, especially the one at the triple SBC. It's quite bizarre what has happened there. This is not a license to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Remember, we must be fair to both parties. These judgments are not saying that an employer can have a second bite at the cherry and try and remedy and build their case. These are, this is not what these judgments are saying. What these judgments are saying is that the commissioners misconstrued the inquiry. They focused on the labels only instead of looking at the totality of the evidence. That's my short answer. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ms. Eleanor.